Welcome back to Quantitative Methods in Chemistry. We are entering into the second week. To start with, let's take a look at what are all the learning objectives for this week. In this week, you will try to understand what is a measurement and what all statistical analysis could be performed with the data or the measurements that are being obtained. We would start by defining what is mean, what is median, what is mode, variance, standard deviation, standard error, accuracy and precision. These are all the different statistical tools that we will end up using to uh, have an assessment of what kind of data uh, or measurement that we have made. And also we will try to understand what is the need to perform replicates, repeats and what does the word reproducibility mean in the field of uh, data sciences. So uh, moving ahead, let's clearly define what is that we are going to do like the way we did last week. Here we'll be defining and listing these statistical terms. We'll be employing them in dealing with scientific data. Uh, to start with, we'll be looking at a simulated data and as we go forward, we'll be taking examples from uh, uh, analytical chemistry to understand uh, how uh, these terms would help us understand. And most importantly, apprise the need of performing uh, duplicates. So this would help you understand how to deal with scientific data. So to start with, uh, let's start maybe with a little bit of philosophy. Uh, science is basically pursued as a systematic evaluation of observations acquired from experiments that help you evaluate and at times develop an underlying hypothesis. A series of coherent experiments are performed to uncover the truth so basically the truth is what we are trying to pursue here and this truth is pursued by performing experiments. So let me repeat, a series of coherent experiments are performed to uncover the truth that help in validating supplementing or rebutting an existing theory. So what do we mean by this? Maybe a theory already exists, for instance Newton's laws of motion. You could get some data to validate it, meaning that you perform experiments that tend to show all the data that is acquired in the new experiments agree with the existing theory. Or it could be used towards supplementing an existing theory, which means that uh, there are some missing gaps in a given theory and your data will help supplement and improvise the hypothesis uh, towards making it a even more fulfilling theory. On the other hand, rebut an existing theory, meaning that you are able to perform experiments that go against the underlying hypothesis of an already existing theory and therefore the data that we tend to seek truth with might help us uncover this. Generally the truth is assumed to be obtained when similar results are obtained across uh, many different people, many different labs and when they are repeatedly probing uh, the same entity with complementary experiments. So basically the reproducibility meaning that if a given entity is measured but by multiple people by different labs at different points of time using different types of experiments yielding the same value helps you adjust the fact that you have indeed seek the truth and have actually found the right value. For instance, uh, the, the mass of an electron has been measured by various different theories and its mass has been determined to be 9.10938. Three seven zero one five times ten power minus thirty one kilogram. So you're able to realize most most of the calculation we end up using nine point one ten power minus three kilogram as the mass of an electron. But here you're able to realize to the level of precision at which the entire measurement has been made over the years. And what do the values in the brackets mean? They kind of mean the uncertainty associated with the last two digits that have been shown. So this week of lectures will help you understand how to deal with numbers and what do these numbers mean. Remember that you entirely spent a week uh, of understanding how to determine concentration of different chemicals in various possible units. Let's say that I am measuring concentration of sodium chloride in seawater 
and you are also doing the same experiment in a slightly different, uh, using a slightly different approach and then we would like to compare our results to see what is that we have gotten. So to compare such numbers and also to understand okay to what level of precision can we give numbers, the statistical tools that we will be introducing in today's class would help you towards the same. Before going ahead, let us uh, try to do an experiment or at least think about an experiment that was proposed by uh, Sir Francis Galton. Uh, this is important to understand because uh, most of the distributions that come up in science uh, follow something called a Gaussian distribution, Gaussian function. And uh, to understand and illustrate the same, Sir Francis Galton came up with a very simple experiment. Let us assume that you have a bunch of beans that have been saved in a reservoir and this is the gate that might unleash them onto the bins that are present here. So let us say that you open the gate and the beans start to fall, of course due to gravity. What kind of uh, bins will actually get these uh, beans at the end of the uh, experiment. So basically one might always argue saying that okay it is right at the center you are only going to have these bins occupied or the other person who might uh, like an uniform society I guess all the bins here would be uniformly occupied. Let us try to look at what when such an experiment is performed what kind of results come up. So the moment the gate is opened you are going to have beams that start to fall down due to gravity. And as they fall down, they are going to interact with the hurdles that are being kept up here. And while they are interacting, what is going to end up happening is that the beans could go on either side after their interaction with these hurdles. Remember, the probability of the beans going on either side is equally likely. And if you have many such beans falling apart or falling from the top, you are going to have good amount of distribution that goes both ways. But remember as you start going to uh, additional levels at the bottom, you are also going to have the beans that start to interact and that is going to push things one way or the other. right? So what is this going to end up happening is to make the uh, beans as they start to fall apart, start to disperse them across from the uh, initial point that they started with. So basically trying to give an idea. Uh, instead of all the beans coming right at the center of where it was released, this is not going to end up happening. We are going to see what is going to happen when such an experiment is performed. When this is done, one is able to see the distribution that beautifully comes out looks like this where significant portion falls from wherever the beans were released. But there are also bins that go farther away from where they were released also populated. But the population keeps decreasing as you go farther away from the point of release. So this distribution you are going to quickly see is like the Gaussian function. So we are going to call it a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. Okay. All this is in terms of uh, uh, a pictorial representation. Why do not we take a, an example of the real Galton board? So the Galton board is available for sale at uh, galtonboard.com and you are able to see the simulation that goes here which will be shown to you right now. What you are able to see here is that this is a board that is made to do the simulation as we saw in the slide a moment earlier. So the first step would involve getting all the beans into the reservoir as we see here. Once that is done, the immediate thing is to open the gate or in this case is just to flip the board that will result in these given hurdles interacting with the beans that come, up out, come about and the bins that are given here would be populated as I had shown in the slides. So let us take a look at such a simulation. So now when you flip this you are able to see the beans start to come off from the reservoir to these different bins and you realize they get populated in different places. One thing that is important for us to note here is that from the point of release most of the bins do end up occupying that spot but you do see that there are bins that are much farther away which ends up 
getting some of the beans as well. So what happens if we repeat this experiment? If you are able to see the certain kind of distribution there, let us repeat it again to just see whether we get the same set of distribution. And you realize there are subtle changes that ends up happening. So basically this is what I started the whole discussion with today. These are the kind of measurements we would end up doing in science where you keep repeating a given experiment and try to understand in this case where did the beads actually fall off from. And you would be able to say if you take the average of all these measurements, it will come at the peak of this Gaussian distribution and you would say this is where the beads were released from in this Galton board. Let us define the Gaussian function. So there are various uh, uh, parameters that have been written here. Here the sigma is called as the standard deviation. More pre precisely the population standard deviation and uh, x is the variable and mu is the population mean or average. So now this function basically when plotted results in something that looks like this. So what one is able to observe that when x takes the value of mu, you are going to have the maximum that comes up for this function. But as x starts to go away from mu, since you have an e power minus function that is going to fall off on either side. So this is a typical Gaussian function and the average is defined as the peak that you are the peak or the, the maxima that you find for this function. Okay, now what does this variable standard deviation mean? The standard deviation means how big the Gaussian distribution is. Basically, you could have a similar situation where the average is the same. But the width is smaller. Of course, I am drawing the arrow at different places. This should be somewhere here. The width is smaller. So in this case, the sigma of blue is less than sigma of red. This indicates the fact that the uncertainty associated with the measurement of x in terms of the blue is less than that of the red as seen from this Gaussian distribution. Okay, So now we are able to realize the fact that the level of uncertainty that comes is associated with this parameter standard deviation and the truth that we are trying to seek is obtained from the average parameter of mu. Okay, good. So now that we have seen these, let us try to understand how much of this average and standard deviation go with one another. So one way of looking at it is to integrate this function. So let us assume a sigma that is associated with the given measurement of 1. Then let us ask ourselves the question, how much percentage of measurements fall within one standard deviation that is mu plus minus 1 sigma. So this can be easily done by integrating between the limits minus 1 to plus 1. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, let us take the average value of truth that we are trying to seek out in this experiment is 0. So that makes our uh, math a little easy to see. So you are going to have 1 by square root of 2 pi times e power minus x square by 2 dx and it is integrated between minus 1 to plus 1 because you are trying to find what is the value of one standard deviation. Let us quickly use another mathematical tool to understand the same. So in for this example, I am going to be uh, making use of a software called Wolfram Alpha that is powered by Mathematica to integrate to make our life a little easy. So integrate the function e power minus uh, 0 0.5 which is 1 by 2 times x power 2 
from minus 1 to 1. So, this is nothing but the Gaussian function that we have uh, defined and of course, we here we have started by saying that the uncertainty or the standard deviation associated is 1 unit which is what reduces to this and of course, there is also a prefactor that goes as 0 uh, 2 star pi to the power minus 0 0.5 because this is nothing but 1 over of that. So, let us integrate it between the limits minus 1 to plus 1 to see what you get. So, this is the integration you wanted to go from minus 1 to plus 1 e power minus x square by 2 divided by square root of 2 pi and what you are able to see is that you get a value of 0.683. So, let us do the same exercise and ask ourselves how much will it be between minus, point, minus 2 to plus 2 and what do we end up getting here? We get about 95.5 percentage and let us go between minus 3 to plus 3. that ends up to be 99.7 percent. So, going back to our presentation, this we found to be somewhere equal to 68.3 percentage. Of course, it is a 0 0.683, I am converting it to percentage between the limits mu plus minus 2 sigma comes up to 95.5 percentage, we can call it 96 percent and mu plus minus 3 sigma comes up to 99.7 percentage. So, what one is able to observe here is that there are still 0.3 percent of your measurements that fall outside the 6 sigma that is mu plus minus 3 sigma. There is 0.3 percent that falls out of this uh, value distribution and this is a very important point that one has to understand that although your average gives you a good understanding, your standard deviation uh, makes you even understand better if there is an outlier that comes into play. Almost every data point that we end up measuring in a very well set up experiment would make you understand what is the uncertainty that is associated with such a measurement. So, let us uh, start with a few more definitions. We just define what is the Gaussian function and uh, how does the standard deviation affect the way the function looks. Basically, if you have a large standard deviation, the function is quite broad. On the other hand, if there is a small standard deviation, the function or the distribution is rather narrow and this helps you understand what is the uncertainty associated with such a measurement. So, let us say you have a given number of data sets. Let us say x is the variable that you are measuring and you measured it, let us say n number of times x i. This is the number of measurements that you make. Out of these number of measurements, let us say you have infinitely large number of measurements, then the population mean will be defined basically as the arithmetic mean, where n is the total number of measurements. When you do not have enough number of uh, uh, data points, we end up calling this as the sample mean which has the same uh, formula but a slightly different symbol instead of using mu we will be using x bar and the standard deviation would be the amount at which it deviates from the mean. Basically, how far does each of the value that you have measured for this given variable x falls away from the average. So, that is going to be given by sum of from 1 to n x i minus mu the whole square divided by n with a square root. And the reason why you have a square dependence here is because you could have values uh, of x i which is greater or smaller than the mean. It does not matter which way they are far away from, you would like to quantify how far is each of the measurement x i is away from the uh, mean that is mu. So, now when you once again do not have enough data sets, this becomes called sample standard deviation. This is population standard deviation. 
that gets the symbol S that is going to be given by sum of i equal to 1 to n like the last time x i of course minus x bar because you change mu to x with the square the whole divided by n minus 1. The fact that n minus 1 comes in these cases is to remove the bias that exists with the small set of data set where if you have n measurements you should be able to get the uh, last value from the n minus 1 measurements that you have made. So these are the definitions that go of course there is yeah, another definition called uh, variance, variance is sigma square or s square. So the value variance also helps you understand how broad is the distribution for uh, the given set of values that you have measured for that given experiment. Okay, so now that we have defined all these functions there are few more that we would like to define. Of course, I would like to uh, make you guys see that we have defined mean, standard deviation and uh, median, mode and the others will be defined as we see more examples. So let us take an example to understand how does the mean and the standard deviation go. So this is an experiment let us say a student is trying to use a burette and is trying to calibrate the burette. How is this burette calibration going? The burette calibration is done such that where the student ends up aliquoting 2 ml of solution let us say water to keep things easy the 2 ml of water is aliquoted into the conical flask and ends up taking this flask to weigh how much does this 2 ml weigh. So now when you have such a measurement made of course at 25 degrees Celsius you can assume 1 ml of water corresponds to 1 gram and if you are able to make measurements of 2 ml every time you are going to get something close to 2 grams. So this is a set of data that has been obtained by students using uh, let us say a more precise instrument to get uh, the values and what you are able to see is that the average values are very very close to 2. You are able to realize that the student has aliquoted quite carefully and uh, let us say that the student instead of using a burette use something like a micro pipette so that the values are this precise. With a burette this might not be that simple or straightforward to obtain. So when such a thing is done let us determine what is the average. The average in this case is going to be for the student 1 is going to be the sum of the first row of elements that we have here. Okay, so that is going to be 2.0137 plus 0.0137 divided by the total number of measurements. Since the, this involves 10 measurements n equal to 10 this is the value that, that you are trying to look for. Let us quickly determine what that is. So that comes up to 1.99608. Of course since we are giving only 4 digits this has to be 1.9962. We will be looking at significant figures as we go forward. And then you, you have to calculate so this is x bar the next thing that we have to end up calculating is s which is nothing but square root of since you have only 10 measurements the denominator is going to be 9 which is n minus 1. This is going to be 2.0173 minus 1.9962 the whole square so this turns out to be 0.062. So what you are able to realize here is that the average val mean value, the sample mean comes up to be 1.9962 uh, plus minus 0 0.062 and this just means that if you are va having values that are within let us say 3 standard deviation in this case it is going to be 0.18 almost all the values basically we are talking about 99.7 percent of the values from these 10 values will fall within that range. Why do not we take a quick look whether that is indeed the case. So what do we mean by that? So uh, 0.18, so 1.99 plus 0.18 is going to be 2.17 is the highest possible value that one could get and minus 1.81. So let us see whether all values here fall. 
yes this falls less than 2 point with the range less than greater than 1.81 within the range, within the range, within the range, within the range, within the range. Within. So you're able to realize all the values fall within the three times standard deviation. Let's ask a question, how many of these values now fall within two times standard deviation? So what's going to be two times standard deviation? Two times standard deviation for this example is going to be plus minus 0.12. So that is going to be 1.87 to uh, 2.11 and here since we are doing two standard deviations, it's going to be 95.5 percent of the values. So let's see whether all the values fall within that range. Yes, yes, barely makes it. Yes, within the value, within the value, within the value, barely makes it, but it's definitely within the value. All these are within the value. So what you're able to realize, the standard deviation helps you get an idea of whether the data points that you got gives you a very reasonable spread. Of course, now let's do the last step here. Let's start to ask how many of these values fall within one standard deviation. The one standard deviation is going to be 1.99 plus minus 0 0.06. So that's going to be 1.93 to 2.05. So right away we are able to realize whichever just scraped through last time is out of this range. This makes it, this makes it, this makes it, uh, next value makes it, this value doesn't make it, this makes it, makes it, makes it. So what you are able to realize 2 out of 10 values which is 1 fifth which amounts to about 20 percent. So although we said uh, only 69 percent of the values meaning that about 30 percent could stay outside you realize that within this data set 20 percent stays outside and this comes up because of the fact that you don't have enough sampling to see the 30 percent falling out. If we had taken a little more set of data points you're going to see about definitely 30 percent of these values that stay out. And now I would leave it to you guys to repeat the exercise for student number two and three and let me give you the average and standard deviation for such a case. So the answer for the average and standard deviation for these examples are, let me write the average on this side and the standard deviation on the other side. The average works out to be 2.020, 1.9743 and the standard deviation as we just saw in this case is 0 0.062, the next case is 0 0.087. And in the last case is 0 0.109. So what you're able to see when you keep on doing the measurements over and over, you tend to see how far the average and st average could change. But since the average is changing within the standard deviation of each of this measurement, one could always say, yeah, you are actually getting comparable values across the different, different measurements that have been made. Of course, this doesn't finish the story. If you want to honestly uh, seek the true value, you want to make infinitely as many measurements as possible. Uh, in the assignment, you're going to get an example where we are going to give data sets across 50 students and we'll try to understand what is the average and the standard deviation. Of course, the sample mean and the sample standard deviation that has been uh, obtained for these measurements. And uh, in order to facilitate for us to understand how things go better, I've already started to plot it to understand how the histogram goes. This is the case where you have 10 data points and you get an average of 1.996 and a standard deviation of 0 0.06 and what you are able to realize here, the average stands here, a lot of the values are close to the average but you are not able to see any entities that come within the three standard deviations meaning that if it's going to be 0.18 to be the triple uh, standard deviation you still expect some points to exist here. But what you are able to see is that that doesn't happen and most importantly you actually do not see any data sets in this given bin. So the bin that we are talking about is the width that one chooses and these for this numerical simulation we chose a bin width of 0 0.05 uh, units and these are nothing with the same bins that you ended up seeing in the Gallot board. Uh, depending upon how big the gallet board uh, bin is going to be, it's going to be taking more or less number of beans. Okay, let's start to increase it. Instead of having 10 data points, let's say we have 20. What ends up happening is that 
you are starting to slowly see the other populations come in slowly. And then as we keep increasing it to 30, you see that the distribution keeps changing here and there, but the average hasn't shifted much. There has been some change in the standard deviation, but within the error of the measurement, uh, this could end up being uh, nothing significant. So let's keep increasing it for 40, the average still stands at 2, but you are once again seeing a weirdity that comes where in the middle of the bend things don't fall. This happens a lot of times in statistics, which is why people uh, suggest you to get as many data points as possible. So let's keep increasing the number of values. You immediately saw a value that comes outside the standard deviation, uh, or rather right at the edge of the standard deviation. Since the value changed, here the standard deviation is about 0.1. So you're going to talk about 2 plus minus 0.3 as the 99.7% of the values and you do see a value that pops up when you have a large number of data sets. So these things tend to happen when you are setting up an experiment. Let's keep going. You are slowly starting to realize that the distribution here starts to come up. It was initially underrepresented. So you go forward, you are able to see that it has come up properly and slowly you are getting towards the Gaussian distribution. But as you increase the number of values, you are going to realize that standard deviation also changes much lesser than before. Previously changed from 0 0.06 to something like 0 0.08, 0 0.09 and higher. But now you are able to realize that it has saturated about at 0 0.09 as you increase the number of values of uh, measurements. Let's keep doing this. Let's go faster. And when you have about 500 such measurements, so we had about 50 students who made 10 such measurements, you are able to nicely see a distribution that comes up. And you are able to realize what is the, uh, these were the standard deviations for 1 sigma and you see about 60% of the values. This will be 2 sigma where 95% of the values go. This is one where in this case you are able to see all the 100% values. But if you increase this number to a much higher number, something like 5000, you will be able to see higher. This is what we are going to see in the example that follows right now. So let's do a numerical simulation to finish off this example. In order to ex exemplify the point that we just learnt in terms of distribution and the measurement that goes uh, uh, with each other, I am going to perform a simple numerical simulation using the software MATLAB. And I am only going to briefly explain the code where all that we are trying to do is for two variables x and y. I will tell you why we are using two so that we can compare them before and after. Uh, we are going to be generating two variables x and y with a given average and standard deviation which we have the power to change and we will be seeing how the distributions change for such a simulation. And we are going to be uh, relying on this uh, mathematical software MATLAB to generate random numbers within the average and standard deviation assuming a Gaussian distribution. So this helps us simulate many, many such numbers within a short amount of time. And of course, we have the power to simulate the way we want to simulate and finally plot it so that we can take a look at how such a distribution is. So let me quickly run this program and the figure that you are seeing here on your screen right now is that uh, the red is for the x variable while the green is for the y variable and since I gave the same st average and standard deviation. So for this measurement, I used the average value of x to be 0, average value of y to be 0 and the standard deviation of x and y to be same equal to 1 unit. So therefore what ends up happening is that you get a distribution that uh, out of which both uh, uh, envelope each other, meaning that x and y envelope each other. So just to give an example of what happens when you change the standard deviation. Instead of having a standard deviation of 1, what happens if you have a standard deviation of 1? So let's simulate it again. So what ends up happening here is that you see that for the x variable where we reduce the standard deviation by half, you are able to see that the width of this distribution becomes smaller. And not just that, you are also able to see that the intensity or the number that comes on the y axis is higher for the red than for the blue. So basically this makes sense since the area under the curve for a Gaussian is constant for these two. Therefore, what is going to happen if you are going to reduce the width, the height has to increase. Okay? Now that we have seen it, why don't we explain, exemplify this fact further. I am going to reduce the standard deviation of x from 0.5 to 0.1. So basically we started with 1, now we are 1 tenth the standard deviation. Let us quickly simulate. We are, what you are able to realize is that for the red which is in the background, the width is much lesser than that of the uh, green. So basically here you can say the green measurement that is y has more uncertainty associated than with the x measurement. 
So let's also simulate a few uh, small changes that come up. Let's say we switch the average. I'm switching back the standard deviation of both to 1. Let's say I'm changing the average of x to 1 while y remains at 0. So now what you end up seeing is that you have two distributions that come up where the peak value for the green is at 0 while that of red is at 1. So what ends up happening here, you still have some values that are on top of each other. Basically there is an overlap between these two distribution. This indicates that these two variables are not very different from each other. You cannot say they are same, like in the previous example, the same average and standard deviation. But one is able to understand the fact there are there is some overlap, meaning that these two variables are not different from one another. On the other hand, let's reduce the standard deviation of x back to 0.1. Let's see how the distributions look. In this case as well, you are able to realize all the values of x fall within the region of y. This just makes uh, the fact that x is determined with a lesser amount of uncertainty than y itself and therefore, once again, these values are no different. On the other hand, let us say we reduce the uncertainty of y also to the same amount, you are going to have distributions that completely fall away from one another. This indicates the fact that these two values do not agree with each other and they, you are not, you cannot compare these two values. Basically these two are two different numbers that you have obtained. Which is why many times as an analytical chemist when you give out a number, a number without a standard deviation makes very little sense. So to finish off, let us once again simulate it with the same kind of variables that we had before, 0 for average and 1 for standard deviation. Here you are able to see the fact that the distributions overlap with each other with the average and the standard deviation being the same. And the next example that we saw where the standard deviation was lesser, however the mean was the same and you still end up saying that the mean value remains same for these two uh, distributions. And another case where you have little overlap which, but the average values are quite different from each other where these distributions start to be different from one another.